everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Today's video has been one of my most requested videos, so I'm happy to finally get this one out to you all. We're going to be taking a look at men's viewings and sort of figuring out which ones we got answers to and which ones we aren't quite sure whether they came true or not. As there are literally tons of these, this video will be part one in a series going through the various prophecies and foretellings in the books. Before getting into the video, quick thank you and shout out to my channel's main sponsor, Audible.com. Audible.com is the largest supplier of audiobooks in the world, and if you haven't checked out The Wheel of Time in audiobook form yet, you are really missing out. In my opinion, it's actually the best way to reread the series. It's great for when you're really busy mowing the lawn, cooking, cleaning around the house, or even driving. I highly recommend them. I listen to all of them. I have all of them, and I'm kind of constantly doing it on repeat. If you are new to audiobooks, or you'd like to check them out and just haven't done Audible yet, they are offering my viewers a very special deal. You can get a free audiobook without any commitment and help the channel at the same time. It's super easy head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and sign up for a free trial there. You'll keep the audiobook regardless of whether you decide to keep their service or not. And doing this along with my Patreon, those are the two best ways you can support the channel and the website that we are creating for the Wheel of Time community. Also, if you can't tell, you can pick up some merch as well. Look at below in the description if you want to check out some of this stuff. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into the video. Let's throw up a spoiler warning here. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with spoilers all the way through a memory of light. Please watch at your own risk if you haven't finished the books entirely. So we are examining men's viewings in this video. But before we get into the viewings themselves, let's answer one question first. What exactly are her viewings? And I guess two questions. What do we know about them? <laughs> Well, Min essentially sees the pattern in a way. She sees images above individuals that indicate future events. Her viewings always come true, but she does not often know what they mean. We know from interviews with Robert Jordan that her ability to do these viewings is not completely unique to her, believe it or not. It's actually an ability that had been lost and is returning with the new age, just like Perrin's Wolf Brother stuff and some other things like that. So there will be others like her. We also know that everything that she sees is always true, whether she knows what it means or not. And just some more random stuff about it, Robert Jordan also confirmed that the viewings are completely separate from the talent of foretelling, and completely and utterly different from what the Finns do. Those are the snake and fox people. So knowing all of this, we can take a look at her viewings. Many of them we know the outcome from, but some of them we still don't. So I'm gonna run through these in chronological order from the books, and like I said, this video will need to be part one of a much larger video series, as there are so many of them. So let's get started. Our first viewings come from chapter 15 of The Eye of the World. We're basically gonna take a look at Min's viewings today from The Eye of the World. So in this chapter, Min first meets our main characters at the Stag and Lion Inn in Berlon. She ends up running into Rand and they have a conversation. She's telling him about what she does and she goes through a bunch of different viewings with him. So her first viewing is of all of the party. She says, quote, Sparks swirling around all of you, thousands of them, in a big shadow darker than midnight. The sparks are trying to fill the shadow and the shadow is trying to swallow the sparks. You are all tied together in something dangerous. So what's this one about? Is it completed? Well, this one can be interpreted as the group being pursued and intertwined with the shadow and how they are all part of the same danger. It is also really about the group of them, Rand, Matt, Moraine, Lan, Tom, and Egwene, all being tied together in the pattern in this struggle against the shadow. Her second viewing is really part of the first. She gives a viewing uh, about Rand and Egwene as well. Egwene's part of it. You're in love with her, she loves you too, but she's not for you and you not for her. Not in the way that you both want. When I look at her, I see the same as when I look at Mistress Alice. She won't refuse it. So this one's fairly clear. Up until this point, Rand and Egwene have believed themselves all but promised to each other, assuming that they will be married in the future. Min essentially tells Rand that they aren't for each other, and even though they love each other, it's just not that kind of love. And then, of course, we later know that Min and uh, Rand are in love. Min kind of knows this at this point, um, but doesn't come out and say it. And then, obviously, Egwene will later fall in love with Gawain. Blech. But obviously the two of them will not be together. There is a care there, but not as lovers. The part about being the same as Mistress Alice, or Moraine in this case, is a reference to Egwene becoming an Aes Sedai 
and not refusing that calling, which she clearly does not do later on. This is actually kind of interesting because it doesn't seem like there's ever a point where Egwene would refuse it. Although I think for a time there, it looked like she might stay with the wise ones, um, which she had very much a strong connection to but she does choose the White Tower. The next viewings from this chapter are a couple that Min spits off in rapid succession. She first says she sees Lan with, quote, seven ruined towers around his head, a babe in a cradle holding a sword. This is actually a difficult one to pick apart. This would seem to refer to Lan's history as being the last son of the Malkyri and his past flight from Malkyr when he was a baby. But this is contradicted by Robert Jordan's statements in interviews saying that Min's viewings are always about the future. Given that it must be about the future, it would seem that this viewing is about Lan's later ride into the Blight in the Eye of the World or retaking Malkyr from the Shadow after the last battle. The baby with a sword would seem to be a reference to the future child of Nynaeve and Lan. Her next viewing is about Tom. She sees quote, a man, not him, juggling fire, and the White Tower, and that doesn't make sense at all for a man. So this one is fairly confusing to pick apart. If we didn't know that her viewings must be about the future, you could say this was about Tom's nephew, Owen. Since that can't be the case, it could be Matt or Rand that is this other man that's not Tom. Matt juggles fire, essentially in dealing with the fireworks and the dragons later on, and Rand juggles Aes Sedai and the world, and the fire could be his use of the one power. Both of these would be strange, though because Min doesn't say that the man's face is hidden. So if that man that she sees in Tom's visions were Matt or Rand, wouldn't she recognize them and know? Because she's talking to Rand and obviously she's seen Matt. Definitely let me know what you think about this one or if there's another take on that. Her next viewing is about Perrin. She says she sees, quote, a wolf, a broken crown, and trees flowering all around Perrin. This one's a bit more straightforward. The wolf is an obvious reference to Perrin's future encounter with Elias Machira, and the wolves and his connection as a wolf brother. The broken crown is a reference to the crown of Saldea, as the symbol of the, of Saldea is a broken crown. He eventually marries Fael and through the succession after the last battle becomes the king of Saldea, as Fael is the last remaining member of the royal line and she would be the queen. The trees flowering all around Perrin could have a couple meanings, and this one's a little bit less clear. For one, it could refer to the apple trees at his family's farm, where his family would later be buried after their murders by the White Cloaks in A Shadow Rising. More likely, however, is another reference to Saldea, and specifically to House Bashir. The sigil of House Bashir is three Red King penny blossoms forever in bloom. This might be a reference to how he becomes the head of House Bashir with his wife, Fael. About Matt, Min sees, quote, a red eagle, an eye on a balance scale, a dagger with a ruby, a horn, and a laughing face. The red eagle she sees is most likely a reference to Manetherin, as the red eagle is a symbol for the ancient nation, and Matt has memories from Manetherin as well as the old blood being strong within him. The eye on a balance scale is a reference to his final trip to the land of the Finns, where he rescues Moraine. He gives up his eye in their escape, and scales are symbols for trade, so this is a fairly clear reference. The ruby-hilted dagger is a clear reference to the Shadar Logoth dagger, which would dominate his plot line for the next two books, and play a part in his role in the last battle. The horn is very clearly the Horn of Valir, which he sounds at the end of book two. The laughing face is the most confusing of these. It could be a reference to his joking nature and his reputation in the future as a gambler and trickster, or it could be a reference to meeting Balthamel later as he wears a mask like that. Although it wouldn't make a ton of sense to single out Matt for that vision. This one is fairly unclear. Let me know if you have some ideas on it uh, in the comments below. Rand then asks Min about what she sees about him. She states, quote, a sword that isn't a sword, a golden crown of laurel leaves, a beggar's staff, pouring water onto the sand, a bloody hand and a white hot iron, three women standing over a funeral pyro with you on it, a black rock wet with blood, lightning all around you, some striking at you and some coming out of you. And then she tells him that they will meet in the future. So Min had quite a few visions about Rand and his are pretty much the easiest to identify. The sword that isn't a sword is clearly Kalindor, a Sangreal he takes from the heart of the stone in Tyr. The golden crown of laurel leaves refers to the laurel crown of Ilion, which he renames later the crown of swords. This is reference to him taking it and becoming the king of Ilion. 
which he rules over later in the story. The beggar's staff is most likely a reference to his trip to Ebudar in The Gathering Storm, where he disguises himself and looks at the city. He makes himself appear as a beggar and uses a staff to walk around. The pouring of water on the sand is a reference to the rain that he called in the Aeol Waste at the end of A Shadow Rising. A bloody hand is probably a reference to the hand that he loses when he confronts Simarog. The white hot iron is more difficult, but it could be the heron mark that is burned into his hand after his battle with the Shamael in the sky above Falma. His sword is melted after the battle and the heron was burned into his palm afterwards. The three women standing over him are men, Elaine and Avienda. The black rock wet with blood is a reference to his blood being spilled on the rocks at Sheol Ghul. This is a clear reference to the Carithion cycle. The lightning coming at him and from him could be a reference to a few things. Practically, it could simply be a reference to the battle with the Shan Chan in Path of Daggers, where he uses Kalendor to call lightning on the Shan Chan, but he hurts his own troops as well. The other, more metaphorical reference that it could be about would be those that are using their power to strike at him, and he uses his power to strike out at the world. A reference to the constant struggles that he would later have with the Shadow, and trying to bring the nations of the world into line. The last thing she says, that they will meet again, is extremely straightforward because, as she knows, she will fall in love with him, and they will spend a great deal of time uh, together later on. The last viewing that we will look at in this video is from Nynaeve in the very next chapter of The Eye of the World. Min states about Nynaeve, quote, She's part of it, right along with the rest of you. The sparks, Rand. She met Moraine coming in, and there were more sparks, just the two of them. Yesterday, I couldn't see sparks with it, without at least three or four of you together, but today it's all sharper and more furious. You're all in more danger today than yesterday, since she came. So this could mean a couple things. For one, it could simply mean that Nynaeve is a part of the struggle as well, which we know she becomes a huge part of. It can also mean that the shadow is coming closer to catching them as well. The fact that Min says that they are in more danger now could indicate that the shadow is gaining on them and is coming closer, which is actually true, is that night the Mordral shows up. So that's it for my first round in this series, taking a look at the viewings and prophecies from the Wheel of Time. The biggest takeaway I get from looking over this stuff is how good at foreshadowing and planting small seeds in the plot that Robert Jordan truly was. There are a number of plot threads and little seeds planted here and there that don't come into fruition until the last book of the series. It's really cool to see, uh, and one of the biggest reasons why I think this book series is so rereadable. Absolutely let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you have some other interpretations of these viewings? Let me know what else they might be. What was your headcanon with it? Please make sure to also like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. Click that bell icon as well. If you are new to my channel, I make Wheel of Time content all the time. Check the links below for my Discord server where you can talk with other Wheel of Time fans and totally geek out with the rest of us about the books. I know a lot of you have always been looking for a place to talk about this stuff and don't have real life friends. This is the place for that. All you gotta do is click that link in the description for the Discord. Even if you don't know how to use Discord, it'll walk you through it. It's pretty simple. Also have various chat rooms there where you can talk about the book series uh, without spoilers, regardless of where you are in the series. So there is a room for each book. Uh, if you want to support what we're doing here on the channel and the Wheel of Time fan site that we are building, please check out my Patreon. That really is the best way to support what I do here. And there are some really cool perks to being a patron. We'll be having our first patron-only live Q&A this coming week, as well as the first meeting of my Supreme Council advisory board members that has input into the direction of the channel and the content that I make. Uh, if you want to see how you can be a part of that, definitely check uh, the links in the description below to the Patreon. Hey guys, thanks again for watching, and until next time, peace out. Think you're in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?